Hi, this is Ray Monsolder. We're back to the surprising book, The Oath, by Frank Peretti. What do you suppose is going to happen? And Tracy has been eaten by the dragon. That was a shock to me because I thought she might be ending up marrying Steve. No, no, even Stephen. So we're in chapter 20. It's called The Dragon's Lair. And he is determined once and for all to rid the world of the dragon. Steve tried to act like the dragon again as he moves stealthily up the slope through the meadow grass and the scattered rock outcroppings toward the ominous little portal in the rock. He paused at the threshold to gather any information his nose and ears might bring him. There was no sound, but he could smell the distinct odor of death drifting up from the black depths. His hand went to the left breast pocket of his shirt. He unbuttoned the flap and dug out his trusty disposable lighter, his tool for lighting campfires and just about the only piece of camping gear he still had with him. Maybe, maybe this was God again. He didn't know. He had no food, no firearms, no coat, not even a compass, but he still had his lighter. He extended his arm inside the opening before flicking the lighter and took his first look down a jagged angular passage that dropped gradually then turned a corner about 10 feet down. This was obviously not the main entrance to the cavern because it was too small. Just a breach in the rock or perhaps an old lava vent. It was big enough to accommodate him, however, so he slipped inside. The lighter's fuel supply was limited so I flicked the lighter intermittently just enough to give him an idea of what was below. Then he groped his way down, feeling with hands, feet, and backside. Flick, see, crawl. Flick, see, crawl. The tunnel steepened. He extended his feet and arms to the sides of the walls to hold himself in place and not slip downward. He progressed a few more feet. The air was cool and dank now. His clothing, wet from the creek and most recently from sweat, was beginning to chill him. He was breathing hard, either from the exertion or from sheer anxiety. He couldn't avoid the sensation that he was going down the dragon's throat. With both hands and his left foot anchored, he reached down with his right foot. He couldn't find a foothold. Flick, he could see his foot below him in the yellow light, but nothing beyond it. He moved the lighter closer, bending almost double in the tunnel to see what was below. The shaft was nearly vertical from this point downward, like a crooked chimney. He would have to inch his way down foothold by foothold. 
spanning the shaft with his arms and legs. He groped about in empty space with his right foot until it finally came to rest on a one-inch lip of rock. Then, with his left foot, he located another lip. He lowered his body down inch by inch by precious inch, pushing against the opposite wall with his arms to keep his back tight against the rocks. Flick, a few more inches, a few more footholds. Sometimes he had to span the shaft with a foot on either side. Sometimes he planted his behind on an available ledge, holding himself there with his feet planted against the opposite wall. The shaft stretched into blackness above him now, curling and zigzagging out of sight. He descended about 40 feet, not far for an elevator or flight of stairs, but more than far enough under the circumstances, Steve thought. When he found a good combination of foothold on one side and ledge for his fanny on the other, he stopped to rest, feel, and listen. The smell of death was stronger now. The air felt thick, heavy, and unmoving. He could sense an open expanse below him. Perhaps the shaft opened into a room. Flick. He looked down past his feet. Something was looking up at him. He thought he'd been scared so often that terror had become a given, but this sight made him jump anyway, and he almost dropped the ladder. He stiffened his legs clamping himself in the narrow passage, then sat there in total darkness again, shaking, heart racing, the lighter clenched in his fist. What he had seen was a human skull. After a minute or two, he calmed down enough to have another look. Flicking on the liner, he was able to confirm it was a human skull about 10 feet below him. Jaw slack, so the face seemed to be laughing. It lay among other bones, scattered about on the cave floor like driftwood on a beach. Steve continued his downward trek. The shaft was opening up, curving sideways into a larger room. Now some fallen rocks provided footing, and Steve stepped carefully from one down to the next, gaining a wider perspective of the cave floor the lower he went. He could see that skull, still laughing. Then he could see another just a few feet away, on his side with no jawbone. Steve's feet finally came to rest on the sandy floor. He held the lantern above his head and kept the flame burning. He'd landed in hell. As far as the feeble flame could cast its light, he saw human bones and skulls. They littered the rock shelves, the ledges, the crevices. 
They lay, lay among the broken stones that clustered in the recesses and hollows. They piled layer upon layer upon the floor. Most were dry, aged, fading to the color of the sand. But some were fresh and white, picked clean but for a few blackening shreds of sinew and tendon, like trophies, a century of them. Steve released a little lever and the letter went out. He welcomed the darkness. It veiled, at least for a moment, the horror stretched out before him. He felt he could hide in it as a child hides under his bed covers. And for a long moment, he stayed right there, regrouping, trying to comprehend the scene. So this is where they end up, he thought. Charlie is here someplace. And Maggie and Vic and Cliff, their final destination. An eerie vision broke into his mind as he stood there in the dark. He could imagine Charlie's Tavern and Mercantile and Hyde River, full of townspeople. Harold Bly was there in his usual spot. Andy and his buddies were shooting pool. Some teens were hammering away at the video games. Bernie was hustling the stakes. Melinda was taking orders. Paul was watching the television over the bar. Then they were skeletons. Even while they ate the food, drank the beer, played the games, lapped it up, and talked about anything and everything, they were dead. Nothing but bones. Soon they would be in this place. They would be like these people. Then again, weren't they like these people even now? Dead while they lived? What was the difference other than time? For the people now lying at Steve's feet, the time had run out. For the people of Hyde River, who could say, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, that all were bound for the same end, dry bones and dragon manure. Steve, Felt a particular chill before the night was over. Tracy would be here. In time, so would he. He could hear the murmur of the bones. As you are, we once were. As we are, you soon will be. His hand went to his heart. The welt had widened and was raw to the touch. It was his ticket to this place. I'm standing in hell. I'm seeing my future and it's not that different from my present. I'm doomed even as I live, which means there's no point to living. So why live? Why struggle? Why prolong my existence? He clamped his hands around his head, afraid his mind would vaporize through his skull. Get a grip, Steve. Come on. Control. There had to be a way out of here. In terms of destiny and immediate terms. He had to remind himself rather forcefully that he was here because he was on the offense. 
looking for a way, any way to turn this thing around, he had to press on. He built up his determination, braced himself, then flicked the lantern. Come on, Benson, let's go, he told himself. He set out walking upon, upon the bones because there was no other surface to walk upon. Each step he took was unsure. The bones twisted, rolled, and crunched under his feet. Several times he thought he would lose his balance and go down to his right. The bones were spread evenly like bedding on a wide ledge. To his right, the bones were spread evenly like bedding on a white ledge, the dragon's bed, he figured. That made sense. His bed. That lizard was death. It loved death. It slept with death. The light began to reach the far wall of the room, and he thought he could make out a vast, dark passage beyond that. Putting one foot carefully in front of the other, he headed that direction. He saw a glint of metal and held the flame lower. A gold necklace. He began to spot other such relics of the past watches, jewelry, buttons, gold coins, even an old derringer. Information. The dragon digested any flesh, muscle, and probably some clothing. He was unable to digest bones and metallic objects, which he apparently regurgitated in this room. That meant he'd be back to this spot before long with one more skeleton to unload. It could have been two. Don't dwell on it. Just keep moving. Steve tried to hurry. He had to know where the cavern went, where the entrance was. He was almost across the room now. He could see a sizable tunnel leading up and out. Another metallic glint caught his eye. Eyeglasses. He stooped to pick them up and recognized the same thick lenses the cockeyed misalignment of the temples. These glasses had belonged to Charlie Mack. He looked around the area, hoping he would not see a skull he could not recognize. Let me read that again. He looked around the area, hoping he would not see a skull he could recognize. He didn't, and he was glad. But he knew Charlie's bones had to be here among the others. There were other items around belt buckles, earrings, and an old hat. It was weathered with a white drooping brim. He recognized it. He picked it up and examined it closely. There was no doubt. The hat had belonged to Jules Cryer. Steve thought he could hold steady, but his strength failed him. He teetered and then fell among the bones, the hat in his hand. The lighter went out and the darkness closed in around him. Live and let live, Cryer had said. Leave the dragon alone and he'll leave you alone. I never bother him, 
So it never bothers me. Didn't that sound like a nice philosophy? But now, Cryer was here with the others. If there was a rational way to process all this, he couldn't find it. The pragmatic mind of the university professor refused to function down here. He wasn't just close to death. He was surrounded by it, immersed in it. And as loudly as his heart cried for an answer, his mind couldn't provide one. He was in hell. There was no other word for it. Oh, Lord, there's got to be a way out of here. His eyes were burning with tears. You can't let this happen. He flicked the lighter and saw that he wasn't far from the tunnel. It just might be his way out of here. He tossed Jewel Cryer's hat back among the bones, got his bearings, and started out again, taking one teetering step after another from bone to bone. Finally, he stepped from bones to soft sand, the actual floor of the cavern. He was to the other side of the trophy room and could see into the far tunnel. The dragon's footprints and the groove left by its dragging tail were evident. He should be able to follow them to the main entrance. It would be a gradual climb with, with plenty of headroom, a welcome change. With his left hand holding the lighter high and his right hand feeling along the wall, he resumed his intermittent use of the lighter, first seeing, then feeling his way along the tunnel. It must have some kind of advantage, he thought. After all, I'm still alive. The dragon hasn't found me yet. He was looking out for me. I saw him, but he hasn't found me. He flicked the lighter. Another tunnel, big enough for a dragon, branched off to the right, heading down into the mountain. But Steve decided to continue following the main tunnel. He could feel air moving down through it. He might not be too far from the entrance. Just ahead, the tunnel narrowed, and Steve noticed the century-old marks of picks and drills. It was a typical mine tunnel, only big enough for miners and ore cars. Steve took a moment to notice the tunnel's dimensions against the memory of the dragon's size. The dragon might be able to slither through, but turning around would be next to impossible. He could feel fresh air moving down the tunnel from the outside, and it quickened his pace. Another 400 feet, and he was looking at the stars again. After the darkness of the cavern, the bright, almost full moon, just rising, would as, was as good as daylight. After the cold, heavy, stench-laden air of the cavern, the crisp mountain air was nearly intoxicating. After being in the lair of death itself, it never felt so alive. I came through. I made it. He looked behind him. 
even from this short distance away. The cavern mine entrance was hard to see. The cliff walls and surrounding rocks were laid out in sharp bends directly in front of it, forming an effective blind. You'd have to be right in front of it to know what was there. But now, where was he? Those mountain peaks across the valley were familiar. As a matter of fact, he took off across the mountain face, leaping from rock to rock, feeling a remarkable new surge of energy. He could see, he could breathe, he could climb and jump, and he was alive. He leapt from the rocks to a field of green meadow, then dashed across the expanse, accelerated because he could do so. He even laughed. He was back from a grave, back from hell, free to run. I beat him. I was right there, right in his lair, and he didn't know it. He's away. He's after someone else. Sure, why not Harold Blyer, the Doug character? There are plenty of people in that town that deserve it more than I do. Maybe Tracy was right. Maybe the mark will fade if I only get away from here. He looked down to check. There was a black stain on his shirt. He touched it and the black slime came off on his fingers. There was no pain. The moonlight went out. A shadow passed over him like a cloud. And he dropped to the ground, rolling to a frantic stop. Then laying perfectly still in the grass as a gust of wind swept over the meadow. Scanning the sky, he could discern the stars wiggling in succession over the crest of Saddle Horse. No, I'm not out of the woods. I'm still in trouble. But I let myself forget, just like Tracy. The wound began to ache again, and strangely, he felt relieved. A long black shadow swept across the face of the mountain. The dragon was circling, searching. It had come so close, it must have seen him. With a heart stained black and the memory of a sea of bones still fresh in his mind, Steve found it all too easy to believe that monster was tethered to his soul. He also knew he didn't have much time. Jeff Nelson, a good miner, the company should have kept knew what was happening. He'd heard the yelling out in the streets. He'd made some calls, he'd loaded his guns, and he was ready to protect his home and his family. Andy Schuler didn't even have to bang on his door before Jeff, Jeff threw it open and aimed his hunting rifle right in Andy's face. Back up, Andy! Andy had five armed men behind him, and Jeff hesitated. I said back up! Jeff! Andy started to say, listen. A gunshot made them all duck. The shot had come from Abel Hoffmeyer, one of Andy's group, a stubble-faced idler who had borrowed the forty-five he held in his hand. Abel was wide-eyed at what he'd just done, but then he started to grin. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jeff had flinched with the rest of them and didn't realize he'd been shot before his legs buckled under him and he slid down the door frame to the landing, still clinging to his rifle. The slug that had torn through his heart had left a bloody groove in the door jam behind him. 
His wife, Becky, started to scream. Andy and his mob all looked at Abel, then at Jeff, each man sorting out the justice of it. John Tyler, a trucker, offered a verdict. He was going to kill you, Andy. Andy recovered from his shock, bolstered himself, and ordered, Okay, boys, let's clear out. With a whoop, they stormed into the house as Becky screamed for mercy, and the four children started crying. Doug and Kyle had moved the roadblock, and they watched as the Carlsons and Malones drove through with whatever they could carry in two pickups and a car. They'd left quite a bit behind, hoping to come back for it, but when it, only when it was safe to do so. Doug, yelled Bruce Dilly, a miner on welfare who preferred not to mine. What about all that stuff left behind? Well, what about it? Well, are they coming back for it? Doug gave him a knowing look. You see something you want, help yourself. There was just a moment's hesitation. What about Harold? What about him? Bruce and several friends thought that over, arrived at a conclusion as a bonnie and with hoops and hollers raced each other to get there first. Steve had to marvel. Jules Cryer never knew how close he was. Steve had gotten his hunch from the mountain peaks across the valley and followed that hunch across the meadow over a rock outcropping into the brink of a cliff where he now lay prone in a niche looking down at the roof of Jewel Cryer's cabin, only 200 feet below him, and not more than a half a mile from the dragon's lair. The cabin appeared to be intact and untouched. <clears throat> Cryer must have met his fate while out on the mountainside, perhaps even lured there by the dragon itself. Steve had no resources, no weapons, no food. He was alone in the dark on the side of a bare mountain, courting the risk of exposure. He had a tenacious beast hunting him down, taking advantage of some intangible but maybe spiritual link with him his friend from the sheriff's office, had been eaten before his eyes. The friend he recognized too late had been shot dead. With no other resources, Steve found that praying to God was taking on great importance. Now, Lord, you've helped me so far. Maybe God had. Seemed reasonable that the dragon would have located and killed him by now. Steve thought about it, and yet, as long as he kept calling on God, the dragon couldn't seem to get a fix on him. With the acknowledgement of God came a sense that somehow the order of things could be reversed. The destiny could be changed for the first time, Steve felt a sense of hope. Hope made fighting for his life worthwhile. It made formulating a plan worthwhile. It made climbing down to Jewel Cryer's cabin to carry out that plan worthwhile. With careful, stealthy moves, Steve started working his way down to the cabin. 
keeping his eye open, watching the sky and surrounding terrain, monitoring the pain in and over his heart. Sheriff Cullen's wife, Francie, was worried enough when the phone rang. Hearing the official sounding voice on the other end didn't make her feel any better. Mrs. Collins? Yes? Mrs. Collins, this is Lieutenant Bernard with the State Patrol. Oak Springs Precinct. May I speak with Sheriff Collins? Mrs. Collins made no effort to hide her concern. He's not here, Lieutenant. I don't know where he is, and I'm worried about him. You have no idea where he is? No. He should have been home two hours ago. He hasn't called. I called the station, but the calls are all forwarded. So you talked to the dispatcher? I didn't want to bother the dispatcher. Lester says that number's only for emergencies. Okay, well listen. We'll see if we can track him down for you. Thank you. And will you hurry, please? Will do. Thank you, Mrs. Collins. Bernard hung up and looked across his desk at Evelyn Benson. Now do you believe me? She asked. At least he was ready to hear more. Steve carefully eyed the distance across the deep crevasse and then jumped it, landing on a narrow ledge. Success. Well, one step at a time, he told himself. He hurried along, mentally talking to God. I think you understand. I mean, it was a mutual thing. She wanted me. I wanted her. He was carrying a box of necessities he had gathered from Jewel Cryer's cabin. Wrapped up in a dark flannel shirt to keep the white box from standing out in the moonlight. Carefully, he stole from rock to bush to niche to rock, then to a lone struggling pine, making his way back to the dragon's cavern, constantly checking the sky and surrounding terrain for any telltale movement. And all the while, he was moving. He kept talking to God. But talking to God presented one problem. He could only talk to God for so long before he had to be honest, not only with God, but with himself. In some areas, that was a new and difficult experience. Okay, I'm not saying it was a smart thing to do. He reached the meadow just below the cavern entrance, hid among the cluster of small pines, and studied the sky again. Then the surrounding terrain. Lord, if he's there, help me to see him. Steve didn't intend for that prayer to have a double meaning, but God answered it that way. He didn't see the dragon anywhere, but did hear a little voice in his mind saying, Look inside. Look inside. That sounded like Levi. Same sermon. Same pointing finger. Maybe he was overdoing the prayer stuff, Steve thought. He shifted his focus to the rock formations that hid the cavern entrance, and then with one mad dash, 
he crossed the meadow and ducked behind the rocks. They go. I saw it first. Get real, you don't even play. Bruce Dilly and Clayton Gentry had both come upon a fine Martin Steele string guitar while ransacking Jeff Nelson's home. And neither could pass it up or give it up. They were out in front of the house, tugging at opposite ends of the black guitar case and about to kill each other for possession. Still another gunshot broke the stalemate. Bruce saw what happened and let go of the guitar. Clayton didn't see what happened till he turned to run the guitar under his hand. A block away, a man lay in the street, clutching his side, a pool of blood widening on the pavement beneath him. The television had been carrying was now being scooped up by the man who'd shot him. Bruce was stunned enough to forget the guitar. Clayton had the guitar and a chance to get away with it, so he ran. Then Bruce ran down the street to the next vacated house. He wanted to get there before Clayton or anyone else did. Steve had only worked with explosive once before. Tried to get some stumps out of a small pasture back home. This dynamite Jules Cryer had been using was a little different, but the setup procedure was enough to figure out. With the welcome help of a flashlight from Cryer's cabin, Steve hastily set a change in the cavern entrance and strung the fuse out for about 30 seconds of burn, hoping that would be enough for him, but not enough for the dragon. And that was only a guess, and nothing better. Then came another action based on a guess. He jammed a stick in the floor of the cavern, and then pulled a piece of toilet paper, courtesy of Cryer's house, his outhouse, in fact, from his shirt pocket. He tore off a narrow strip of the paper and struck it on, stuck it on the end of the stick, letting it hang down like a flag. Then, okay, it was working. His hunch was right. The little flag was waving, wiggling toward the cavern. Air was moving into the cavern at this end and apparently flowing out through that other tunnel he'd passed. So this little warning flag might work if he was lucky and if there was a god. And if in the whole cosmic scheme of things, he was meant to survive the night. There remained one last thing to double check. He pulled the lighter from his pocket and flicked it. It worked the first time. Okay, all set. Car 30, car 30, West Fork Central. It was Julie, the dispatcher, calling from Central Dispatch in West Fork, the hub office that received all the 9-11 calls for Clark County and then notified the appropriate authorities. Deputy Brad Johansson grabbed the mic from the dash of the patrol car. Car 30? Brad? Yeah. Have you seen Sheriff Collins tonight? No. When I clocked in at the office, nobody was there. Where are you now? About eight miles out of West Fork on 209. Well, we got a call from a state, the state patrol. Collins' wife hasn't seen him either, and she's worried. 
Johansson sneered a bit. He was getting a call from a dispatch because Francie Collins was worried. Johansson wasn't worried at all. Collins was a big boy and could have been sidetracked by any number of things that can come up when you're a cop. So what do you want me to do? Go back to the office, see if you can find out anything. And interrupt my rounds? Like what? The sheriff probably got sidetracked. It happens. The state patrol wants to know if there are any signs of foul play. What? Julie said it again, slowly and clearly. The state patrol wants to know if there are any signs of foul play. Now that was weird. Okay, I copy. I head right down. Car 30 is clear. He found a wide shoulder, made a U-turn, and headed back toward West Fork. When Johansson had clocked in, <coughs> excuse me, the office had been quiet, deserted and clean. Finding no one there was a little odd, but he didn't give it a lot of thought. Things got quiet around there at night with the phones forwarded. Tracy Ellis, the officer, he was to relieve, could have been out on a call. Already in a hurry, he'd signed out car 30 and left to do his rounds. Now, taking a second look, careful look at the place, things did seem a little strange. For one thing, Sheriff Cullen's patrol car was still in his parking lot. And yet, it was nowhere around. He always drove that car to and from work. So obviously, he hadn't driven home. But that being the case, where was he? The door to Collins office was ajar. Johnson nudged it open with his nightstick, used the nightstick to flip the light on and looked around inside. Nothing looked out of place. There were no notes or appointments scribbled anywhere that might say where Collins was. Johansson went out to the counter and checked the sign-out sheet for the day. Both Collins and Ellis had signed in that morning, but neither had signed out. He grabbed the key to the cell block, opened the metal door, and walked down the narrow corridor to the three cells. He could smell a faint trace of bleach and detergent, but he couldn't tell where it was coming from till he got to cell number three. The floor, walls, ceiling, and bars of the cell had been scrubbed clean. Well, that wasn't unusual considering the prisoner they were keeping in here the night before. But he kept it in mind. He went through the rest of the office and found nothing unusual. <clears throat> the Department of v Motor Vehicles area looked the same. So did the office area, the conference room, and the coffee room. Yet his instincts told him something was wrong. He went back to the counter and leaned on it, thinking. Collins had signed in, but didn't sign out. His car was still here. His office was clean and neat. Cell 3 was scrubbed clean. The other rooms looked undisturbed. His office was clean and neat. Johansson went to Collins' office door again and poked his head in. Well, it did smell rather clean in there. He knelt and sniffed the floor. Yeah, 
floor cleaner. Little bit of bleach, too. Somebody had scrubbed this floor just like they scrubbed the floor of cell three. Now, why only this office? Why only that cell? So maybe he wasn't looking for signs of foul play. Maybe he was looking for the obvious lack of those signs. Then he spotted Cullen's jacket on the coat rack and went over for a closer look. The moment he touched it, he noticed black smears all over the back, as if someone had used the jacket for a shop towel. He sniffed it and wrinkled his nose at the smell. Where had Cullen's been to pick up this stuff? From this corner, he could see behind the open door. And now, he saw something. He used his nightstick to swing the door aside and knelt down to examine a stain on the floor that whoever had done the scrubbing had missed. He grabbed his handheld radio. West Fork Central, car 30, John Hansen. West Fork Central? Oh, West Fork Central, came Julie's voice. Go ahead, Brad. Call the state patrol, I might have something. Steve was out in front of the tavern, cavern entrance. Plainly visible, scanning the sky. In the flanks of the mountain, walking nonchalantly back and forth and talking loudly. I guess Jennifer had a gentler hand. You know, women, the way they are, you have to make them feel loved and give them flowers and all that garbage. I mean, what did she expect? Like I've got time for that kind of thing? I earned a living, didn't I? That shouldn't have been, I mean, that should have been enough, shouldn't it? He kept his eyes open, but so far nothing looked out of place. I mean, a man's got to do what a man's got to do. I've got my life, my career, I've got marriage to track and tag, papers to write, classes to teach. The very fate of nature itself hinges on my involvement. Jennifer never understood that. He paused to listen. No sounds yet. And she should have. She was the problem, not me. Hey, if our marriage fell apart, it wasn't my fault. Far to the east, a star wiggled. Then another. How long should he keep this up? Steve wondered. Anyway, maybe it was all for the best. It made me available again, and I can't knock that. When Tracy came along, I could. He should have known this part would hurt. I could. <laughs> maybe now would be a good time to quit. He couldn't help thinking of Cliff. It had been so easy to blame him, to be angry with him, to marvel at his impulsiveness, his stupidity. Well, Cliff, better move over, bro. I'm standing in the same place. Guess I didn't learn much from what happened to you. Maybe, as Harold Bland said, Stephen just preferred not to think about it. The wrinkle in the sky was coming his way across the valley. He could see it widening, growing. Time to get inside, he dashed through the crooked blind of rocks to the cavern entrance, 
then looked up in time to see a definite shape descending. He could hear the rush of wind over the wings. He ducked into the cavern and around the first corner. And then he waited, his back tight against the wall, every nerve on edge, the ladder ready in his clenched fist. A puff of wind whistled through the cavern entrance, and that little flag of toilet paper fluttered straight out from the stick. Then the flag settled back into a slow, lazy waving in the incoming current of air. Steve held his breath and remained motionless, watching, listening for the barely audible sound of the dragon moving over the ground. A claw clicked against a stone. A wing rustled as it folded. There was a long, even scraping sound over the gravel on the mountain slope. Steve remained rooted to the cave floor, fighting terror, fighting the impulse to flee. He heard a quick, quiet huff of air through huge nostrils. A pebble fell from somewhere and plinked on the ground. Steve craned his neck just enough to check the dynamite placed against the wall of the entrance. A shaft of moonlight had found a path through the rock blind and washed the cavern wall silvery gray. No sound, no movement, nothing but waiting. Come on, come on, Steve thought, his thumb on the letter's flint wheel. Stick your big ugly head in here. A shadow appeared, an indefinite shape along the upper reaches of the cavern wall. The dragon was breathing in amazingly slow, prolonged breaths, and then releasing them in a stream that seemed to last for minutes. And from the sound, it had to be just outside the entrance. Come on. The shadow on the cavern wall grew descending downward, dropping like a veil over the rough surface. Long, steady breath made the paper flag flutter. Then the flag drooped, and the tunnel entrance went black. Silence. No motion. No sound. The big lizard was thinking about it, Steve thought. Maybe he could smell a trap. Perhaps he knew what dynamite was. The moonlight returned like a flash. The flag fluttered toward the entrance. Only one footstep fell hard enough to make a grating sound on some rocks. And then there was no sound at all. The thing was gone. Or was it? Steve remained where he was, waiting. He craned his neck around the corner to check the dynamite again. Now for the biggest wait. The biggest gamble. He stood motionless in the cold dark was so quiet, he could hear the rumble of blood flowing through his ears. He allowed himself some slow, deep breaths, and then waited some more, willing himself to remain there, 
watching the little paper flag in the moonlight. Stirred lazily, occasionally rippling as the air moved past it on his journey through the mountain. Then the flag drooped. Steve stopped breathing. He watched. The flag hung motionless. The dragon had reached the other entrance. Now for the time. How long to wait? Just how long would it take for that thing to sneak up from behind? The flag began to wiggle slightly, but the direction of flow was uncertain. Steve tried to count to guess the number of seconds that had passed. We're passing right now, should pass, before he lit the fuse. The flag began to drift toward the cavern entrance. Then it started to wave. Then it rose from the stick and began to flutter. Steve stepped out from the wall and could feel the air moving up out of the tunnel. He's on his way. Steve flicked the lantern, wincing at the sudden light. He went to the fuse, set the flame to it, and the fuse erupted in red sparks and a plume of smoke. He could feel wind at his back. He could sense a vibration, a quivering in the floor. He dashed out the cavern entrance, zigzagged through the rock formations, and bounded across the meadow, coming silently, then in a whisper, then out loud, 21, 22, 23. Halfway across the meadow, he looked over his shoulder and saw nothing happening. 30, 31, 32. Boom! The sound hit Steve's ears like a thunderclap then returned from across the valley and hit them again. Then rumbled, rumbled, rumbled down the valley like a hundred bowling balls down a stairway. He stopped looking, looked back, and saw a cloud of dust rising and rocks falling back to the earth where the cavern entrance had been. All he could do now was wait, listen, and watch for the verdict as the rocks settled. The pebbles quit rolling and the dust drifted slowly away. Now there was nothing but torturous, taunting silence. Steve crouched in the grass and remained still. Depending on where the dragon was at the time of the explosion, it could be trapped or crushed and dying or dead or safely on his way out of the cavern by another route. Steve could only hope for the best result, but there was no way to know until a rock wiggled, scraped, then tumbled away from the entrance, then another, then several went tumbling aside as dust went up again and dirt hissed through the rubble. Steve felt sick with disappointment. It trapped the dragon for a few moments, but he hadn't killed it. The game wasn't over, and he doubted this little time out would last very long. Steve looked ahead. Jewel's Cryer Cabin was over the roughy rock rocky bluff out of sight. 
if he ran, he could just get there in just a few minutes if he had a few minutes. But he couldn't run, not yet. He had to let the dragon see where he was going. It's crazy. He heard himself thinking, run now, you idiot. But he couldn't do it. If he really expected to end this thing, he needed the dragon to follow him. Against the terror that urged him to run, he stood in place and watched while the creature clawed and scraped his way out of the mountain, casting boulders away as if they weighed nothing. Long claws appeared through the rocks, groping about. Now Steve could hear the thing huffing and chugging. He could see the dust blasted away in small clouds by the angry breath. Ah, oh, you're beautiful when you're angry, Steve taunted. The head appeared, the silver horns glistening in the moonlight as the creature stretched and strained to see over the rocks, scanning, searching. Then the golden eyes locked on Steve. The dragon's head lunged in Steve's direction like a rattlesnake trying to strike, but the body was still held fast in the fallen debris. The creature was incensed. Steve took off running for Cryer's cabin as he heard the rocks flying and cascading from the cavern entrance. The huffing of that thing's angry breath the beating and bashing of its claws against the debris. Steve ran over the rocks along the cliff up the crevice. He jumped at landing on the precarious ledge on the other side. He lost his balance, fell forward to his hands, then got up again and ran. He could see the cabin below. From far away, he heard a sound like the world's biggest parachute snapping open. The dragon was free and had taken to the air. Just another few seconds down the trail, over and around a pile of mine waste, and he'd be at the cabin's front door. He heard the rushing and beating of the monstrous wings above him and looked up. No camouflage this time. The dragon was a clear, silvery shadow in the sky, its eyes like the landing lights of an aircraft locking onto him like lasers. Steve ran, leaping over the rock, stumbling over a boulder, bounding ahead. The cabin was close, but not Close enough. Not close enough. The dragon swept its wings back and began to drop down to the earth. Its image growing, stretching, filling more and more of the sky. Its shadows swept over the cabin as Steve reached the front door and clambered inside slamming and bolting the door behind him. Crash! Three silver claws pierced through the ceiling, then twisted, yanked, and withdrew. Steve hit the floor against the rear wall. His body curled, his arms upraised for protection. The golden eyes appeared at the window. They saw him. The claws crashed through the window and groped about the cabin, throwing the table against the wall like a toy, breaking out the opposite window, hooking the bed, and flinging it across the room. Steve wriggled on his belly rolled like a log, scurried this way, that way too. Too busy dodging death to fear it. The razor-tipped claws whistling over his head, impaling the long walls, wrenching free, then groping again. One huge Golden eye sputtered him through a window. Steve leapt aside as the claws 
drove into the blank floor like spikes. The dragon pulled, yanked, wretched, all but one claw free. The last claw pulled up a floorboard which remained impaled on it. And now the board flew and flipped about the room with a hand smashing and shattering everything in sight. The shovels, picks, and drills went flying. The bookshelf disintegrated. The books and papers filled the room like feathers from a burst pillow. That thing was huffing in fierce anger. Steve expected to see flames any moment. As a claws withdrew through the window, they pulled out the window frame. Chung! The silvery claws punched like spears through the metal roofing again, jutted into the room, and then curled inward as the dragon crumpled the metal, the planks, the plywood. The dragon tore at the cabin roof, ripping away the sheet metal, yanking the rafters loose, and pulling in them up like toothpicks. One huge golden eye, spotting him through the window, had caused all this. Steve remained tightly curled in a corner of the cabin, watching his little fortress disappear in flying shreds and wondering how long he should wait. Now the cabin was open to the sky and the huge head punched through with scarcely room to turn and twist. The eyes like burning lamps, the nostrils flared, the teeth bared, snorting and snuffing after its prey. It's time, Steve thought. He ducked through the thick wooden door in the back of the cabin. One huge golden eye was only inches from him when he slammed the door shut and bolted it. He hurried down the access tunnel to Cryer's mine, hoping the dragon would try to tear the door open, hoping the beast wouldn't notice the... The dragon noticed an entire row of explosives set out along the back wall of the cabin. BOOM! The mountainside erupted in a bottle of fire as logs, furniture, roofing, blankets, canned food, planks, rafters, and picks and shovels soared into the sky borne aloft on a plume of flame and smoke. The dragon limit of flame its wings shredded and burning, floated upward, then backward in a long, slow arc, then dropped like a flaming aircraft, down, down, down the mountainside, until it landed on its back in the low, scrubby pines just above the tree line. It rolled one, two, and finally three slow turns, down the hill before it came to rest against a stand of firs. Deep inside the tunnel, leading from Cryer's cabin to his mine, Steve cowered in a tight corner, his fist wrapped in a death grip around the detonator. And that's it. <laughs> Sorry, but I will finish the book next time. Chapter 21 is called Havoc. Don't miss it.